matters. Okay. Well, boy, do we have some, some stuff for you today. I'll tell you that. Um, great. Um, so uh, today, as I said, is a grab bag of, of different um, topics. And uh, we have several topics which have been identified as really high priority um, based on yesterday's exercise and others which I think really need to be explored. So um, I'm gonna go in quick succession through several topics that um, were sought and see if we can do, offer at least abbreviated comments uh, on them. And uh, two of the topics that I wanted to hit on were modeling best practices um, and, uh, and then model performance issues. Um, so we'll, we'll go hit those matters here. And it's been a number of years since I've delivered these. Um, and I had to update them um, accordingly. So I actually have a set of best practices um, that are distinguished into two sets of slides. Some are more process oriented, about how to, how to achieve, um, uh, favor, you know, enhance your chance of achieving favorable outcomes in a modeling pro process. And then others are, are more technical in nature. And there's a lot of them both there. Students who have taken software engineering from me will actually recognize that I speak here partly as a software engineer. And particularly when it comes to technical side, but also some when it comes to process side. A lot of what I'm saying um, you can find well documented in its application to software projects, software engineering. Because at the end of the day, model projects, agent-based modeling projects have an element of software. Um, now that may sound scary to people. Some programs, they look like strange people, stuff like that. Um, but the truth is that um, spreadsheets are, are software artifacts too. And there've been horrible stories about companies not treating spreadsheets as, as software artifacts that have led to horrendous problems, um, including you know, decisions that have cost companies millions of dollars because of not uh, paying attention to quality, quality assurance processes for spreadsheets or not versioning them properly, et cetera. So this is not models only. We live in a world where so much of our life is involved in, you know, is computer mediated that, that these issues come up in many other areas of modeling. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna talk about overview and, and, um, and, and model process. And I, I kind of like to make this distinction between, yes, oh, uh, sharing, screen sharing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so there's two important concerns I want to speak about here. One is building the right model and building the model right. Um, uh, these are both important for, for quality and modeling. These are both important for effective um, types of modeling. They're not the only considerations. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in building as Jeff McDonald points it, useful models that get used. Um, but you know, building, building the right model and building the model right are, are both you know, very important needs for delivering value in our, in our model. Um, and building the right model is often a matter of getting off to the right foot in terms of model scope and, and model conceptualization, this division between endogenous, exogenous, and ignored factors, um, having, a, having a, a set of model attributes that, for which you're shooting and 
in evolving the model so that it's most likely to lead to success. And you know, a key need, um, uh, there, there are sets of key process needs that will aid this. Building the model right is, a lot of that is about the implementation. Um, there's some formulation, but there's a lot of it is implementation. And, and there, there's this consideration of software engineering principles. Um, you know, and uh, and these are just as important in modeling as they are in things like um, use in R and data analysis and modeling. Um, so building the model right involves applying a set of software engineering processes, um, uh, a, a set of software engineering principles um, and practices, uh, and some of these are more on the process side and some are more on the, on the uh, implementation side. And I'm, I'm gonna be going through a set of these um, in, in quick succession to sort of communicate some urgent needs here. I could spend three hours on this presentation, but we don't have time to do that. We don't have the luxury to do that. I wanna talk about process best practices. Um, I think, you know, if, if I had to pick one, it would be process best practices, to be honest. Both are super important, though, and, and each without the other will cause problems. Um, uh, un, failing to undertake process best, best practices will tend to lead to models with implementation problems, and models with implementation problems will lead the process to end up being um, much more um, challenging and involved in firefighting, et cetera. Um, so develop incrementally. Uh, we, we talked about this on the second day, right? Develop your model in little steps. I, I urge you to run early, run often. I urge you to, to add things in so you know what's changed, observe the results, learn from those results, critique you know, what you see and possibly investigate if it could be a sign of a problem. That would be just so much easier if you do it incrementally. And you can get guidance from stakeholders. Um, so showing frequently to stakeholders for feedback and knowledge elicitation is really important. Um, in modeling, it is amazing how much more knowledge you will elicit from stakeholders if you show them a model partly built on. Um, you might think that you know you could sit them down and and they could enumerate in a stentorian fashion their knowledge of this area and you could write it down and be happy. But the truth is that that's not the way the human mind works. And there's a lot of tacit knowledge. here. And sometimes until they see model output that reminds them of something that they've seen in their life or that flies in the face of something, until there's something they can relate to, something concrete they can see with the model. Often there's a lot of knowledge that doesn't come out, but at the right time it pours out. And it's often tacit in the sense that it's not explicit knowledge. If, if you would ask them to enumerate factoids about their knowledge of the system, it's a whole lot they probably forget to mention until you put them in front of something that reminds them of that. And they say, I've never seen anything like that. That looks unrealistic. Or they say, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that, that is kind of what it looks like on weekends in our health system you know, practice, but on weekdays, it's, it's slower. Or they'll say, that's what it used to look like before we instituted this change. Or they'll say, oh yeah, that, that is the flavor of, of what I actually see. So knowledge elicitation is so much easier when you have something in front of them. And so you show them these things along the way. Um, it's a good practice to maintain a record of runs that you have, have undertaken. And there are projects which, where we've done this and many where we haven't. And you know, it's something where I think our labs game has to be updated. We, we've done it in, in some cases up the wazoo. I mean, it's been quite, uh, quite extensive. Um, and we built tools for any logic that allow automatically logging this information. I think it's before the time of all my current students. We, we have tools that will, when you run the model, it will automatically log 
things like who's running it, you know, what's the current time, what's the model version, create a copy of the complete model file, record the random number seed, record the model parameter assumptions, take a picture of it at the start, picture of it at the finish, et cetera. And this is really, this is really handy because then if you have results um, from that that are of significance, you can record, okay, these results were from this run, which is all documented, all the metadata. And maybe that goes into a paper or maybe it's presented to some balls or whatever it is. And if they ask you later, think revise and resubmit, so I go back and modify that, you know exactly where it is. You know the exact assumption, the exact model version, all of that is documented. And that's good practice. You can do this manually. We have these tools based on aspect-oriented programming that did it uh, automatically. Um, save all versions of model. Preferably use a version control system. I mean, there's all these folks in data science these days, all these health scientists I know who have learned Git. <laughs> they, don't, they, don't know. <laughs> they don't know what they're getting into. But it's, it's really, really fun for me to see as a computer scientist because we've been using these version control systems from the 80s and and um, and now you have them use in, in health sciences in some quarters with people doing our programming and so on and it's great it's just uh it's it's fun to see it's fun to see um so uh you know save save your versions of the models and and uh, use use tools if possible um if you do this, you can easily go back at any point to an earlier version of the model. You have short, brief descriptions about why the model evolved. You find out you know, who built on what version of the model. You can, you can identify changes between versions of the model, and you can go and, and um, you know, easily reproduce results from, from earlier versions, et cetera. It's very, uh, it's very valuable process. And it is increasingly used on the data science side of health sciences. And I think it's just wonderful. Um, uh, I will say that there's a huge amount to learn from practicing software developers. In this area. So where this just, it, 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 it is pursued with um, enormous attention is in software development companies. And you know, someone like Eric, or, or Larissa here, um, who have worked as practicing software developers could tell you about you know, using Git, for example, for, for modeling projects. I will tell you that any logic in Git are not the best of friends, but um, uh, they're also not enemies. Um, uh, Git, Git uh, works uh, very, very well with text documents, and any logic models are text documents. They call that XML file, um, which is a structured document. Um, but any logic isn't great at support. I mean, it, it, well, let me just say, I mean, it's horrible, supporting version. It's, it's really not good. So you can check it in, you can save it away with Git, and all that's fine. But it just, it could be so much better than it is. And it's, and it's not, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, you know, if you go modify something in the model, it's, um, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's very hard to merge that with another version of the model visually. And it's very hard to have multiple people working at the same time. It's needlessly hard. It's gratuitously hard. It is shamefully hard. I hope that people can hear. Um, so it could be so much easier. And uh, modern software development tools are designed to support teams, and we need modeling tools that support teams. And Eric, together with Cheyenne and, and others, are, are working on these team-based modeling tools that, that are kind of like Google Docs for models. And they allow many, many people to be modifying models at the same time and running it and, and probing it. If you want to see it, you can, you can ask Eric to show you. Um, OK, if you discover problems in a model, glitches, uh, gotchas, et cetera. Try to reflect on the modeling process. Like, how did that come about? How could I have found it sooner? So you can learn from it and try to head it off. Try to learn, don't, when, when a mistake is made, you know, 
welcome finding mistakes. That's, that's great. But then try to ask, how can I do even better next time by preventing it or finding it sooner? And, and you can really inquire, like, what led to that mistake? Was it a, maybe I should spend, you know, I, I didn't know how this function in any logic worked. Maybe I can up my game in terms of looking those things up, consult with people. Is there a misunderstanding about Java? Is it, is it a miscommunication between two of the modelers? Just try to reflect on you know, how, how we might be, how might we be able to do better? Software development companies can be quite good at this whole area of continue, you know, improvement, investing in their process and being reflective about it. One of the things I would most recommend, and our lab does have a history of this. Um, it's, if I had my druthers, we'd probably do it, you know, um, several, uh, several times as often as we do now, but typically we do a few a year. Um, I, I think we could fruitfully do a few a month, probably in many cases, is peer reviews. So in software development, peer reviews are everywhere. And I, I have to say that I was proud to be in a first generation of software developers as a, as a working um, software development professional in the 1980s uh, when we used peer reviews um, kind of for the first time together with versioning, together with continuous integration um, and, and, and daily builds and so on. It was before continuous integration was fully modern because the, the speed of compiles wasn't there. But peer reviews were a key part of that process and they've achieved an industry best practice designation, particularly in their, in their inspection area, um, in the area of formal inspection. But peer reviews, including pair modeling, is really valuable. I mentioned this the other day, but the idea of pair modeling is having two people. They could be, you know, one could be a beginner, one could be advanced, both could be moderate level of, it doesn't, you could have totally different mixing. Have them work together on a model. And magic will happen. Great things happen. Knowledge is transferred, two heads thinking about it are better, it's a lot more fun. And you know, issues are identified early. Um, it's, it's an amazing process, um, pair modeling. You can also do it with stakeholders and, and reason it through with stakeholders. And often you find them helping your understanding in enormous ways. So we do a lot of our work these days with pair modeling with stakeholders. That is like via Zoom or something like that. Ideally, it's called you folks are doing pair modeling in the incubator. Folks in the room, and that's pair model. Do we get alongside each other? Maybe one person's hands are predominantly in the keyboard, but that's true for pair programming. Well, one person is predominantly the driver, but the other person is looking and thinking about it, you know, making observations and suggestions, and they're jointly discussing. It. This is a, it's, it's, you know, there are a few things that are, that have a better combination of characteristics, you know, it's good for you, it's, you know, uh, it is fun, it is um, very helpful in terms of preventing problems or diagnosing problems in terms of spreading knowledge, spreading stylistic understanding, you know, getting improvements to model documentation. There's all these different benefits. Use it, do pair, pair, pair modeling. And these days with the Zoomification of the world or Microsoft Teams or, WebEx or whatever your favorite platform, you know, there's the, the, the distance barriers, you know, are not as, as, as steep as they used to be. Um, uh, I mentioned Strive for Process Improvement. Um, uh, I like to encourage people to use, to just try something out with a throwaway model sometimes. So in software development, we create what are called spike prototypes. And these are, you, you just try an idea out and it's just consciously a throwaway situation, but you're just focusing on trying out an essential idea and you'll learn from it, how well does that fit on for size? And then you go on and, and you apply it in the real. You might wanna think about that. Um, it's a good thing to test your model out with extreme scenarios. So in software, when, when we build, software um, in the world, um, we, we do so 
in a fashion that extensively makes use of tests. And these tests exist at different levels. There's this high level of tests through the user interface, the integration tests, pieces that come together, the unit tests. And um, you know, any good software development shop works at salt is kind of a big investment in testing in addition to peer review. These two have to be, you know, these two are complementary. They're in fact they're synergistic. Tests show needs for peer review. Peer reviews can be used on tests. Um, peer reviews can get good ideas for testing because there are some things that are easy to spot um, uh, and can then be incorporated, uh, but, but, are, but are harder to test. There are also things that you, you recognize and it's like really hard to think about. And you say, let's put a test to sort of test this systematically um, going, going forward, something like that. Or you find an issue, a type of issue in peer review, and you say, oh, we can test for it in time. Anyway, testing is, is one of the key advances that's occurred, like the proliferation of huge test suites that have occurred in the past 50 years or so. Um, and again, I was proud to be part of, of, of some of early work in that area, where there'd be hundreds of tests run nightly, for example, against software. And in any logic, tests are not well supported, but you can run scenarios with extreme scenarios. So for example, think about running your model without, you know, um, uh, without mental health distress um, being, being um, initialized at all. So there's, there's no, it's a healthy population. Or imagine running it with a, um, a small population, but very high death rate, something like that. You could try it out with, with certain extreme cases and just make sure the model behaves sensibly for those cases. Um, uh, turn off death and if people are still disappearing, there's some sort of problem, um, you know, and, and you'll sometimes find problems by disabling things altogether and seeing, oh, it still doesn't make sense. You simplify the situation so a problem would be obvious if it's still a case. Um, so it's helpful to often have a high level characterization. Um, and um, you know, have, have a description of it. It's often when writing up a model for a paper or for documentation that we really think through what does it represent. And in software, we use documentation accompanying a product, but it, I think. Here there's, you know, with, with scientific progress, there's, there's a lot of good things that come from just trying to describe the situation. It's through verbalizing it or putting it in text, through describing it to others that you often make place, uh, take place. There's a process in software engineering called rubber duck debugging. And the idea is you, when you have a problem, you talk to the rubber duck and you describe the problem. And that gets you to think through what's going on. And you know, there's something about the human brain that actually comes to better insights when we verbalize it, when we articulate it, when we describe it. Therapists know this, right? Um, there's, there's something that comes out. It's something that, that gives us insight about the situation just by characterizing. Um, so talk to me. You know, Talk, talk it through, um, do rubber duck modeling. And it, it can be quite helpful. And then finally, try to integrate with others work frequently and small steps if you have other people working on it. You know, don't, don't bring them together in the big bang. Um, uh, when I was young, um, software projects were subject to what was called the big bang. So they'd work for many, many months on a given version of something. You'd have different parts of the team working on it. And then they'd integrate it you know, several months in. This was how big shops tended to do it. The um, company I was working out tended to do, be much more nimble. And every day, they'd be bringing things together. But the traditional thing was to work for many weeks and then bring them together, sometimes months. And all sorts of hell would break out. When, when they bring them together, because there'd be all these incompatible changes and you wouldn't be able to get them to mesh properly. And, and 
it wouldn't be. Um, so, you know, if you have several people working on the model, mesh it together very frequently. If you have several team members working on it, bring it together. Um, you know, several several times. Um, okay, this is a very practical thing. This is a, this is a dumb thing. It's a dumb thing. It's a, it's a, unfortunately a needless thing, and it really should be fixed by any logic, but I need to warn you about this. I don't know how much headache this has caused me. I mean, it's a lot of headache. My students are by and large familiar about this. Um, okay, here's the deal. Any logic as a piece of software, it evolves a successive version. Some of you may have encountered this if you, if you you know, start up any logic and it says a newer version of any logic is available. Do you want to upgrade? Right? You've probably seen this a lot. And if you're in any logic, um, you know, you can go help about any logic. You could see this is, you know, build 8.7.12.2022.05.25. You can kind of read the date out there, right? But that's version 8.7.12. See that? Okay, now here's the shocking thing. Here's the shocking thing. Um, so in any logic, it cares about that, about those versions. Now that's understandable, right? You expected that maybe version nine is gonna be a lot different than eight. And version eight is different from seven. Okay. And so if, if there's someone out there running any logic seven, and I gave them a file from my version, you might expect it to have some problems because that's version seven, this is version eight. And they might say, oh, I don't have that file. I, like I don't have action chart or whatever it is. I don't have something that you're using didn't exist back in seven. We can all understand. And that's how software normal. Um, but any logic is like ultra persnickety. It's, it may be the most persnickety I've ever seen in my life of any program. It is utterly shockingly persnickety. What I mean by that is if I have version 8.7.12 and someone else has 8.7.13 or something, and they save it, it may, I may not be able to read it. The file, because it may say like, this is from a later version of anybody. And maybe they, you know, they got theirs a month later than not. And it's not 8.8, .8. it's like 8.7 point something. Um, now, it could be that I'm exaggerating. It's not 0.13, it would take to 0.15 or whatever. But this comes up everywhere. It's, it's such a bane to my group. Because different people are updating their any logics at different times. New graduate students arrive and they get any logic on their machines, or they get a, someone gets a new machine, a new, by the way, we call computers machines um, or boxes. Um, uh, so they get a new box and they upgrade any, or they get any logic on it and they have a new version. And, and now if they save something, I can't see it. And it's just a mess, it's, it's, it's silly. Okay, so what to do? Well, okay, we have our ways. Um, and I'll make, I'll make clear our work around in just a moment. But the most important thing is try to have an agreed upon standard for whoever you're working with to upgrade any logic at the same time. So if someone has to get new any logic, the other will, will get those versions. Now, any logic, um, uh, does release these versions very frequently. And that's part of the problem, you know. In a, in a way, it's very good. I actually think they're quite good about, you know, uh, going and, and releasing some, some nice new little new updates, but, but um, you know, try to update together so one of you is not stuck in that. Okay. Okay, now, the secret is, it's like a, there's a hack, okay? There's something we call a clue, a hack. Um, and it turns out that any logic 
files are text files. So you can go edit them. And so when my student, if Nastaran gives me a, a version of her long COVID model, um, I probably can't read it because that's the case. So she gives it to me, I can't read it because I have uh, 8.7.12 and she is 8.7 or 1.5 or whatever it is. And so then I just fire up the text editor, <laughs> don't change it. And I say this version is from an earlier version of any logic, then I can read it fine and I can convert comments. On. So that goes on like a lot in R3 and it's terrible. It's terrible. And I've, in some past years, I've told my students, let's all upgrade together, but it's somehow never, I've never enforced it. So just be aware this is version, you know, dysfunction. Maybe I'll show you what that looks like. Um, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'll go open up, a, a, let's go call up a text editor here. Um, notepad, okay, there's not even notepad plus plus, it's just notepad, okay, fine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open that and I'm gonna go and open up a text file here, downloads and, um, okay, it's so only look for text documents. And look for ALP documents. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to open this up. There it is. And you can see there's a ALP version here, right? Um, that this is the one that I think it, it gets persnickety about. Wade, do you want to comment on this at all? Oh, you just changed it to... So like you save one with your current version and then you change this whole line to match what you currently have. <laughs> yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, that's what we call a hack or a clue. And it's not a good thing. This is like, this is bad. This is evil. Um, this is not, not good. This is not good, but it's what we've been reduced to. Um, and you do what you have to do. Um, but the, the better solution would be for us to update together, okay? Um, but uh, this, this is kind of the pathetic state we're in. We, we sort of, you know, limp around and, and, and when, when someone sends me a later model, because I have so many students with later versions, like, and yeah, okay, I can go upgrade and have yeah, fine, um, and I'll do it periodically, and then it gets out of date again. Yes, Eureka. Well, that's what I announced uh, once or twice, but but no one paid attention. <laughs> so, and and new 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 people come in and they don't know the rule and so on. So that that is supposed to be the rule that I'm supposed to say like do not any no one upgrade any logic until I tell you, and then we're supposed to update. But it doesn't happen. Um, yeah, I could comment on that, and I, I see Bjorn had his hands up as well. Okay, so what are in the commercial paid version that's not in the org? Um, the commercial paid version exists. Um, well, okay, so there's there's two uh, paid versions. Uh, one is University Plus Researcher. That was its name. Maybe it has a different name now. Um, and uh, and then there's uh, professional. Um, Professional version. The um, uh, the commercial um, versions uh, both put aside a limit of fifty thousand agents being created, um, uh, and and that that is um, you know a binding uh, a binding constraint for many. So if you if you have a model that needs a million agents. You're going to need one of those other versions. Okay. Um, uh, there is also support for, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, for additional types of um, experiments, which Wade and I commented are kind of nice to have experiments. Um, 
So if you do file new um, experiment, you'll notice that they're like compare runs, Monte Carlo sensitivity analysis, custom. Um, these are grayed out. And uh, as Wade and I both commented, parameter variation can be used to implement a sensitivity analysis. But sensitivity analysis has this wizard that allows it to be done more easily and create graphs for you automatically of certain things. Um, similarly, calibration, it, it, basically you can do anything you, you want to do with calibration uh, in optimization experiment, but this makes it extra easy. And compare runs makes it easy to compare successive runs of a model. Uh, Monte Carlo, we, we kind of did that. We drew from distributions for parameters, but it makes it extra easy. A custom experiment is a very advanced thing that, um, you know, really, if, if, if you're doing methodological innovation on it, it can be useful. And there are some other, like if you're engaged in really serious use of, of large any logic models um, and trying to finesse things, sometimes, I've, I've almost never used a custom experiment. I think in our lab, maybe we've used it, you know, we've created them four times or something like that over my 20, 21 years of using any logic or something like that. But Wade, do you want to comment on custom? Like, okay, so, but you create them and then you use them, right? So yeah. you don't create them all the time. Oh, is that right? Okay, so like uh, with many, many processors or something like that, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay, that's that's really helpful. Um, and that brings me to one of the most important related things uh, that I wanted to talk about, which was um, in, in any logic um, with this menu up here, I don't think it's even in here for this, but in the professional version, you can export an any logic model to then run outside of any. And what that means is it can be run by someone who doesn't have any logic installed, no, no any logic installed. It can also run on a, on a separate computer that doesn't have any logic installed. Um, and that's, that, that's been useful for really large models that need to run sort of in parallel. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever personally built a, uh, I've, I've never did uh, a custom experiment like that. Like, you know, it is, it is used to sort of put it out there uh, on other machines. Yeah, Michael. Yes, correct. And um, there's uh, there's there are some there are some considerations there. It depends whether you're talking intranet for stakeholders or internet, because there's some issues. So, so when it comes to dealing with putting things online, IT departments are particular, um, and. And you get into things like browser security issues because someone who comes there, um, the IT department wants to make sure it's not insecure software and stuff like that. And this has gotten more of an issue in recent in, re in the past half decade with any logic because Java was created. And Wade, I'll get to you in just a sec. Java was created in the 1990s to be the language of the internet. Right about or something. I remember it. Um, Sun Microsystems created it, and um, it was supposed to be the language, kind of the lingua franca of the internet. It was supposed to run, run, you know, programs on any computer. You could run them over through Java on the internet. It was sort of a, a you know, a, a portable, totally portable language. And um, at some point in, within the past decade, people got quite concerned about. Java's um, potential for um, causing, causing issues, and I think security issues were part of the concern with browsers. And, and so it became 
it became that you have to give permission to a browser to run Java. And that, that meant when people go and run, because AnyLogic's on Java, and it was built to allow this sort of internet use. Um, and for many years, they, we used this extensively and it was great, you could put it up and people could come. But now I think you have to say, enable, like disable the security restrictions for Java. And that requires, you know, either IT enablement or it requires someone to go through some menus on their browser, which is kind of painful, right? And so I, I think that took the, took the wind out of the sails of just how easy it was to make it usable. On the other hand, if you want to do it in an IT shop, like a shop that's well supported by an IT department, you want to do it in an intranet of an organization, there's, there's really no problem. So we've done that with health partners, for example. Um, I think uh, uh, Leah Lamp put her model of devil tumor facial disease um, up at San Diego Supercomputing Center for internet distribution. For internet distribution, I'd have to find out exactly how, how that was done, but we're, we're working with Alberta Health Services to do something similar. It's, um, the, the deal is basically um, that you need, you need to get a bit of guidance to, to make sure that people can run it and that they won't be too inconvenienced by this issue of, of being having the uh, security setting having to be set for the browser to allow it to run. But wait, you probably have uh, some really good comments on this. Yeah. Mm. We figured out ways to do it with Docker. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> mm. yeah. For, for the prof if they own a professional license, they could do it. Really. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. It, we should have a discussion though, because if it's an organization used internally for that organization that owns any logic professional, I think actually uh, it, it may lie within the license. We, we've had several organizations look into it. So we could we could talk separately. <laughs> that's that's right that's that's right but um so so those are good points so uh so what you're saying is it can be distributed in a way that allows download but what any logic does prefer and what they do enable with again with with paid licenses um and i, I don't know the scheme that pays for it it's a cloud a cloud-based character on any logic cloud and and that that support comes also through these uh, these sort of licensed versions of that, and particularly with um, professional or or sub professional. You know, if it's on a university. You could do the cloud as well. Yeah. So so you may have noticed on some of these, like wandering elephants. Uh, SAR agent based calibration. You notice it says cloud. And I think basically that allows, in principle, for you to run it on, on the cloud. We could probably comment on that more. Okay. okay. Sure. Um, so, any logic cloud provides infrastructure for running that. Is that fair to say, Wade, remotely? If they're run basically, in the cloud and there's a user interface provided for people to see it for a web-based browser. 
And so it's run outside of the organism. So if, if uh, sensitive data were involved, it might be that. But otherwise, it's in a, it's in a public place. Good. OK, awesome. Thanks. So um, oh, there's a final feature. I'll, uh, uh, one or two final features I'll note. So um, with the paid versions, um, there's uh, some point, and I think it may be with the researcher version. I'd have to check. Wade would probably know. I think it is the reason I'm almost certain it's the researcher version. It certainly was for many years. There's a debugger. There's an AnyLogic debugger. And if people are interested in seeing the AnyLogic debugger, that could be shown. Um, it allows you to basically more easily track down the source of a problem. Um, or let's put it this way: it gives you extra tools for tracking down the source of a problem. Um, I will tell you that I use the AnyLogic debugger. Uh, I do a lot of debugging. I use the AnyLogic debugger probably about 5% of the time, so, um, just because I, I find it's easier for me to, to not use it for most of the time. And debugging tools like that are useful, um, but um, you know th they're not a necessity. You can actually solve most problems fairly readily without them, I find. But they're, they're nice. Um, it gives you extra flexibility and Sometimes for students learning to debug, it can be a it can be a helpful thing. And so, you know, I, I think it's a it's a nice little feature to have. There's no question. There are ways of connecting external debuggers to running any logic models without using the any. There so Java debuggers can be used to to sort of um, connect to an any logic model and and basically debug in a somewhat similar way. But any logic debugger has some nice, nice features that make it extra easy. Um, but occasionally I'll use just a Java debugger and, and um, you can see the code and you can step through the code and you can set breakpoints and you can print out variables. Same sort of thing you can do in the any logic debugger, but um, any logic debugger has some additional uh, bells and whistles to it. So, those are some comments. Uh, connecting to a running model is something you can do. It doesn't doesn't require the, you know uh, any particular. Data. Hopefully that's helpful. Yes. Quite right. Quite right. And you get yeah yeah quite right. So I think any purchase gets you upgrade rights within a year. And then, and this is really important. I mean, um, I, I, I welcome Wade, I know, has been particularly heavily involved with uh, different versions of any logic and decisions about purchases and so on. So he's particularly well attuned to um, sort of understanding what the issues are here. But um, uh, my distinct uh, impression is that. Um, when you purchase a version, you um, you have upgrade rights for a year, but then you can continue to use it after that. Um, you know, whatever version you have, you can continue to use. And in that sense, it's quite different from SAS's model, for example. SAS, the, the popular statistical software, is per seat per per year, and so you have to for each successful year you're paying. You're not paying here for year, but you just don't get any upgrades after the. Um, and uh, and yes, uh, you you have access to any logic support for that year. And um, you know, I, I I would look to others for any logic support comments. We occasionally contact them to say, "Hey, go fix this." <laughs> Basically, um, but occasionally we'll ask a question that's a little bit more. Uh, seeking a bit of, of of guidance on like where this is going, et cetera, um, or you know what's what's the issue with this. Um, but uh, I think they can be helpful um, for sure. Um, uh, you know, I would look for any comments. Uh, Wait, have you interacted with any logic support much? Huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> well spoken. Okay, so that that's good. Um, uh, any any comments uh, from you? I know in the times I've dealt with them, I found it easiest just like in my first email to extensively document. So I sometimes like record a video of the problem and and then I put I put it, you know, unlisted on on YouTube and I say like this is a video showing the problem. And yeah, and, and attach the model is very important. And if possible, simplify it so it occurs like right away or something like that. And then they say like, oh. Okay, um, I see the problem. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is this is a, a good thing. Um, I think you want to just put it right in front of them and make it so it's really obvious. I I have to say though that these are general issues with um, support for software for a lot of software projects in general. Um, so I've been this this is kind of. Culturally, it goes on a lot in help help support things. They're, they're you know, they, they want to see it right in front of them. Um, and if they don't say, like, I don't know what they're talking about, you know, um, let's just see if it clears up and they'll email me again if it doesn't or something like that. So so it's really helpful to get it uh, in, in front of them. Um, I, yeah, I, it's good. If you, if you can demonstrate in a very obvious way, I remember sending mail to another modeling software company, Denson. I had like, it was, it was a great little illustration. It was called the arrow of death. And it was like, if you draw, if you draw the arrow to this very much, so I sent them the, very, the model with the variable. I said, take an arrow, click on another variable, draw it to that one in the model, and Denson dies, dead. Um, it, you know, this is the arrow of death, um, try drawing it. And they demonstrated, yeah. Um, so they went and fixed it. Um, the arrow of death is no longer there. And I think I did something with them. Okay. Um, so um, let's see. I <clears throat> time is time is getting on. So um, yeah, a couple couple more things. Is there any logic tool for creating documentation that um, I'm rather fond of. And I'm actually not sure if this is specific to, uh, to a particular version. No, it's, it looks like it's an all version. So um, you notice there's this, if you right click on something, you say create documentation and um, you can basically say, where do you want to put it? And um, you know, what, what, what model and if it should be portrait and so on. But more to the point, you can specify what you want it to include. And so like maybe you don't want experiments, you don't want to describe the database, you just, you do want to include state charts, but nothing about, you know, presentation. And I want it in a PDF, let's say. Um, you could also choose a Word document or you know, a web page or what have you. And then you could say finish and and you know it's uh, it's it and you know it puts it in a document um, so you can see the sequence of things from there and it tells you what the sort of properties are of it etc. So this is this gets you somewhere. It one of the primary complaints I hear about any logic is you know the logic is spread out many places, kind of any place like. Or all places you know, spread out, and um, and so this this allows you to sort of create a list that you know create a document that that's that that sort of lists comprehensively a set of information. Um, and if you put it in a word document, it can be quite helpful. Um, uh, so we've seen this. 
Um, so I've talked about incremental delivery. I'm not going to you know, um, dwell further on this. Um, um, you know, focus on building up the models incrementally as insights arrive. Um, and, and there's many benefits. Peer review I've spoken about. Um, it's a review of a model artifact by peers. Um, it's not a review of the person, it's a review of the model. And, and these can be conducted in more formal or less formal ways. And within software development, there are uh, extensive resources on conducting effective peer reviews at these different levels. Um, uh, the most formal, including um, formal inspections and then less formal things like walkthroughs, et cetera. Um, you will find you know, many, many resources, including books and so on, which describe this. And these are, uh, these are useful resources for models, I will say. Um, not everything carries over, but a lot does. Um, and they've been found to be incredibly effective in software, and I find them very effective for models. Um, uh, we have at times been asked to come in to review models by others. And so, you know, a bunch of my students focus on other people's models and tell me, you know, analyze them and, and assess, assess their, um, assess their merits and, and identify issues. Um, so there's this whole spectrum of, 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 of reviews um, and they have sort of codified processes associated with them with inspection requiring pre-work and you know, pre-inspection pre meeting, focus set of goals and documentation during the meeting, follow-up meeting about whether this is fixed. And, and um, uh, formal roles at the meeting, et cetera. But you know, pair programming or pair modeling, peer desk check, ad hoc reviews are much lighter weight things. They're, these are just really, really good tools. They're, they're extremely valuable. Continuous integration involves pe putting people's contributions together in an ongoing way, and you know, building the model and ideally running it. And if you have multiple people work on a model. This is really uh, recommended. You know, don't have them work independently for many, many months, and then try to do it. Try to do it on an ongoing basis. Um, um, yeah, I, um, I, I don't, um, I don't think we'll. Um, I'll talk about this, but um, testing is is really valuable, and and trying out scenarios that are sort of testing out the model in simple ways. By simple, I mean like extreme obvious cases um, uh, can be very valuable. So suppose it was a population only of elders. Uh, suppose it was a population, you know, uh, just of young people and you try running the model with that and you see the results or what have you. And you, you make sure it's giving sensible results. Um, okay, so I made, made a bunch of comments on some best practices there. Um, this is just in the process area. And um, I have other comments on technical best practices, which um, I think we'll, we'll get to after the break. So maybe we'll take a break and then we'll, uh, we'll reconvene for another set of best practices. Thanks very much.